Good evening. My name is Jara Patrick. I'm the director and curator at the Law Warshaw Gallery at McAllister College. I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's conversation, A Spoonful of Sugar, which will be led by Yvette Mayorga and Robert Pasolino. Before I welcome our guests, we would like to take a moment to honor the fact that many of us in attendance occupy native land. Here in Minneapolis and St. Paul, we are on Dakota land. This is the ancestral home of the Dakota, Ojibwe, and Ho-Chunk people who were forcibly exiled from the land because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism. We make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota people, ancestors, and descendants, as well as the land itself. I know that we also have attendees joining us from across the country, and we would like to encourage you to take a moment to honor the histories and peoples of the region you are viewing from, and if you'd like more resources on these histories, native-land.ca is a great place to start that conversation. So currently the Law Warshaw Gallery is closed to the public, um, really since this last spring as a part of McAllister College's response to COVID-19 to keep a safe environment for our students, staff, and faculty. Our gallery space remains closed and McAllister College is not open to visitors at this time, in lieu of brick and mortar exhibition programming, uh, this fall and winter, we are hosting a remote residency with Chicago-based artist Yvette Mayorga. During her residency, Yvette has been working on an expansion of an ongoing project entitled Monuments of the Forgotten. Um, this also includes a catalog which will chronicle a body of work of hers entitled Monochromatic Dreams uh, and a couple of public programs, including this one, which feature local and national guest speakers. I'm pleased to welcome you to the second of these programs, A Spoonful of Sugar, Yvette Mayorga's Anti-Monuments. The program will be formatted as follows. I'll introduce both of our guests and they will engage in conversation for about 45 minutes, at which time we will take questions from the audience. All questions may be sent to me directly through the chat feature. Um, and I hope to get to all of these questions, but will also assist in moderating these to ensure that they best serve our discussion for both content and time allowances. In addition, this conversation will be recorded, which will allow us to share it at a later time through the Law Warsaw Gallery and through our guest media channels. It's now my pleasure to welcome our guests. Yvette Mayorga is a multimedia installation artist. She boldly engages viewers in socio-political dialogue centered on the immigrant experience, experience in the US by fusing confectionery aesthetics with references to familial labor. Mayorga holds an MFA in Fiber and Material Studies from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and has exhibited at the Vincent Price Art Museum, Expo Chicago, Untitled Art Fair, Art Design Chicago, LACMA's Pacific Standard Time, the Chicago Artist Coalition, the National Museum of Mexican Art, and Geary Contemporary. Mayorga has attended the Fountainhead Residency, Bolt Residency, and is a recipient of the Maker Grant. In this past year, Mayorga's work, Meet Me at the Green Clock, was commissioned by Johala Projects as a part of Andy Warhol's exhibition at the Institute of Chicago. She has been featured in Art Forum, Artnet, Art News, Chicago Magazine, Hyperallergic, New City, Teen Vogue, The Guardian, and was on the cover of the Chicago Reader. Her work has been featured in arts advocacy conversations like Arts Alliance in Illinois, and very recently the DePaul Art Museum uh, also acquired uh, a piece of Yvette's uh, entitled A Vase of the Century. We're also joined by Robert Casalino, who has been called the curator of the dispossessed, uh, a title which I really enjoy. Um, for championing underrepresented artists and uncommon perspectives on well-known artists. He has collaborated with many contemporary artists and in 2014 organized the largest American Museum exhibition of David Lynch's visual art. He's also a native of Chicago and studied at the University of Illinois at Chicago before receiving his MA and PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His work on American art, uh, he has emphasized regional diversity integrating the artists of Illinois, Wisconsin, California, and other areas into installations, thematic exhibitions, and his scholarship. Before joining Mia, he was the senior curator and Evelyn and Will Kaplan curator of modern art at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia, where he oversaw more than 30 exhibitions, including retrospectives of George Tucker, Peter Bloom, and Elizabeth Osborne. He acquired more than 2,000 objects for the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, 
mostly gifts, including the Linda Lee Alter Collection of Art by Women and major collections of work by Sue Ko, Ellen Lanyon, and Miriam Shapiro. Um, with this, it's my pleasure to give the screen to our two amazing guest speakers. Um, I hope you enjoy our program. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. Yeah, thank you, Jira. Uh, so it looks like I need to get my, I need to have my ability to share the screen again. Oh, you got it. Let's see here. Okay, thank you. And with that, great. All right, so hi, Yvette. How are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm fine. Um, so why don't we just begin by talking about the background of this installation that you're doing for McAllister and uh, where it originated and what are some of the themes? This is a shot of uh, an earlier iteration of it uh, exhibited in Austin, Texas, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so Monochromatic Dreams was originally exhibited um, at the beginning of this year in, in January of 2020, um, which seems so far, far away from, from today, um, at Mass Gallery, which is an artist-run space in Austin, Texas. Um, and in this exhibition, I also began the monument, Monuments of the Forgotten, which is um, ongoing now. And um, all of the work will be traveling to the Law Warshaw Gallery um, in September, 2021. Um, but the Monuments of the Forgotten installation is site specific to Mass Gallery because it, it began there by asking community members to donate um, and drop off shoes that uh, they no longer wanted. Um, in an effort for me to uh, begin this monument by holding workshops with community um, to teach them how to pipe using the traditional um, piping bags that I use to make my work with plaster and paint onto the found, found shoes. And so through the duration of the exhibition, the monument accumulated in, in scale. And the hope is that, um, you know, with this open call that we have running now, um, I've been receiving shoes nationally and I'm continuing to add to the monument. And Monochromatic Dreams is uh, one of my first exhibitions where all of the work was created um, in monochromatic uh, color schemes. So all the work is in, in hues of pinks. Um, and it includes uh, a vase of the century series where I'm uh, recontextualizing the century vase, portraits of my parents um, after a painting of um, Boucher's uh, daughter, a portrait of his daughter where I'm renaming it a portrait of the artist's parents after the artist, mm -hmm. um, Boucher and um, uh, Monuments of the Forgotten. So it's, it's a painting and, um, and immersive installation with Monuments of the Forgotten. So shoes are so personal, uh, you know, whether it's style, we experience, you know, major life events, whether they're graduation or going to funerals or weddings, um, really happy moments, important, you know, moments of transformation in shoes uh, and we pick them out and select them deliberately. They have such intimate meaning. And so, you know, asking people to select these shoes that they're not using anymore, which still might have some kind of memories connected to them and sending to, um, you know, there's a profound gesture in that. And I guess I wonder what do these particular articles of clothing mean with regard to this idea of a monument. Who are they monuments to, Yvette? Yeah, and so, you know, they're named uh, monuments of the forgotten, but I, I like to view them as an anti-monument because the work is, you know, attempting to monumentalize the amount of uh, migrants who have crossed the US-Mexico border um, and lost their lives in doing so. Um, shoes are objects that are often found along the border alongside, um, you know, 
other uh, objects of food, which I know we'll get into later with uh, other work that I'll be discussing. But so, you know, through, through having community donate shoes that are so personal, right, that do hold meaning, that mm-hmm. um, serve as portraits of individuals, um, I like that, you know, connection to the individual while some, you know, creating a monument that is to unnamed migrants, right? They're also individuals, mm-hmm. although um, I may not know, you know, them personally or, or have names listed onto the shoes. I, I want, you know, that personalization um, to exist within mm-hmm. the work. And did you do, did you say you did a... Um a piping workshop with folks in Austin. And no, we can't really do that now um, for the St. Paul presentation necessarily, but um, talk about that. What is that material on there? Yeah, it's plaster. So I often uh, either work with plaster or acrylic, like a a modeling paste, which is a a thicker acrylic medium. Mm -hmm. Um, And I use either medium, you know, because of the viscosity of the medium, the way that it holds its shape. And um, actually, when I began making my monuments, a lot of my sculptural work and installations, I was using either plaster or frosting and and plaster specifically because I also um, wanted to reference uh, my familial labor and construction aside from candy, um, baking and craft. And so it holds that weight for me also. um, And it, you know, and the material itself is so similar uh, to frosting. And so through the workshop, um, I, you know, I taught folks how to use uh, the traditional piping bag, um, how to fill it with plaster and um, how to uh, you know make reliefs with it onto the shoes and um, just you know traditional sort of baking motifs that are often found on um, cakes as um, you know decorated lines on cakes. Mm -hmm. Well you know a lot of your work um, has that that sense of an embellishment that comes from what you just described that you know, food references, pastry, the sweetness, and the title of the conversation tonight is A Spoonful of Sugar, which is a reference to a song, a Spoonful of Sugar Helps the Medicine Go Down. So we've talked together before about this idea of delivering content that is serious and needs attention, um, whether they're social justice issues, or issues of human rights, um, through this sometimes described as sickeningly sweet uh, aesthetic. And you are really well-versed in the history of art and the uses of the Rococo. So in this particular piece that we have on the screen now, which is called, I remember eating hot chips when my dad got deported after after J.H. Fragonard, uh, The Swing. So it's after this particular painting, um, and a real, really well-known painting in the history of European art, um, and uh, is a cheeky painting. It's about flirtation and all sorts of other things. So why the Rococo, Yvette, and, and how did you decide to align these two forms? This form that seems you know, superficial and about the upper class um, and frivolous, uh, and then this really serious, sometimes personal content that the world needs to pay attention to. Yeah, you know, I always like to say that for me, it really began with, um, you know, my background growing up attending Catholic church every Sunday. Um, I really thought of the Catholic church as the first art museum that I ever went to because I didn't actually go to an art museum until I was about 18 and it was the Art Institute here in Chicago. And so I was, you know, heavily influenced by these European, you know, paintings and uh, figures that, uh, you know, embellished the inside of the the church uh, here in the Midwest and also, um, you know, back in Mexico, like they're very Baroque and Rococo in nature, um, gilded in gold, um, you know, uh, images of of the cherubs uh, amongst a religious imagery. And um, so I was really fascinated by um, the feeling of being surrounded by so much gilded imagery, but then having no 
actual connection to it and always feeling like I had a lot of questions about the meaning behind these images. And, you know, I was always told that I couldn't ask too many questions because there wasn't a lot of answers, um, you know, religion. That's always helpful. Um, yeah, very helpful. And so I think what it did was that it really drew me to be like super curious about the history uh, of these paintings and, you know, through making my work and using um, frosting at first to reference my mother's labor and baking and then eventually, you know, moving on to acrylic, but in the same medium, um, and, you know, and, and referencing, um, you know, certain contemporary art history artists, um, I naturally just saw the connection within, um, you know, the, the, the aesthetics of my work and the aesthetics of the Rococo and it just seems so fitting for me to reference a time in which um, you know, there was so much happening um, politically, and there mm -hmm. was also so much joy and leisure um, at the same time, and sort of um, an ignoring of that, um, of the political unrest at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's, it's really uh, sort of foretelling of, you know, the moment that we're living in now. Um, and so, yeah, I like to use it for the aesthetic reasons of you know the the palettes and the excessiveness of it but also you know because of the the history of it and I also want to mention you know that um, aside from the Rococo and the Baroque making its way into um, you know um, Mexican or you know Mexican-American uh, churches and um, it's also found you know in the home inside of the home and in the way that uh, we celebrate um, and all the aesthetics that are celebratory are very Rococo in nature because they're heavily influenced by Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So really it's a sort of after fact of uh, colonialism for me. That's an, it's an inherent part of me now. Yeah, and you know, when you're talking about your experience of um, the Catholic church being your first um, way of mediating images and seeing paintings and decoration and things like that, uh, you know, we all we talked before about how, like you, my first experience of an art museum wasn't until I was a teenager, uh, much later, and it was the Art Institute. And I had been in churches as a Catholic as well, and um, you know, spent a lot of time, as is the intention, uh, looking at really brutal, violent images of martyrdoms and the crucifixion but all of it is delivered in um, really beautiful uh, ways. You know, the paintings are gorgeously articulated, the bodies are beautiful, um, but then there's this, disc, this discord between, you know, that kind of sense of sacrifice and um, violence and then the way it's delivered. So I, I see that resonating somehow in, in the way that you're thinking about subject matter and aesthetic um, and how it all goes together. Definitely, you know, and I, and I, and I also, you know, think because frosting or um, the appearance of something that's edible is so familiar, you know, across generations, um, you know, backgrounds, race, etc. I think it's something that when we visually see it, um, you know, it reminds us of a moment in time, a celebratory moment in time, or you know, a personal um, experience with frosting, with food specifically. And so, you know, I wanted it to be this way of um, sort of bridging the gap between, um, you know, the, the imagery and the content of the work and have it be this first invitation uh, where, you know, the audience, the viewer wants to view the work because of the material and mm -hmm. then is naturally drawn to um, discover that the work is about a lot more um, other than aesthetics and references of the edible. Yeah, and you know, I wanted to show um, the folks who are are listening in tonight uh, a couple other views of installations you've done, just to connect with what you were you're talking about before about um, that idea of being in an immersive experience of the church, for instance, where all of the decoration, even if it's um, generated over decades and decades, contributes to a, a feeling. And one of the things that's remarkable about your own 
your own work is that in all of your installations, you're thinking about the walls, the surface, the color, the lighting. Um, there's multi dimensions to the kind of artwork that you're designing for those installations. It's not just two dimensional work, it's freestanding sculpture um, in this seemingly impossible balanced um, edifice there, for instance, in an in installation that you had, was that one in Chicago? Or no, that one was in New York, I can't remember. Um, um, the one on the right is in Indianapolis. Okay, and then on the left, um, uh, that's part of an installation you did at the National Museum of Mexican Fine Art in Chicago? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, that one is called Make America Sweet Again, right? <laughs> From 2017? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and then how the did video... that, yeah, go ahead and talk about that a little bit, if you could. Yeah. And the video is called uh, Great Again. And so the video takes images of my 2D work, uh, which are images taken from references of the interior of my home. Mm -hmm. And the video animates the images to show um, references of militarization um, that happen within the home. And they're also done in a bird's eye view. So you get this feeling that you're sort of an onlooker viewing from the outside to the inside of the home. Mm -hmm. So that's a video that's playing um, on the left side in the installation. And um, yeah, the walls were, were dressed with plaster, piped plaster that references a lot of the imagery that's inside the video. Um, you know, some of my monuments are present from, uh, from earlier work from 2014, 2015, um, the, th the three sculptures that are um, present. And then the, the back wall, references the actual uh, wall. And it's interesting to see uh, this piece now. I think it's it's been a while that I've like visually seen it. Um, and just thinking about the sort of references that have made their work into my paintings that I, mm -hmm. you know, we'll discuss later, like images of uh, hands or, you know, flags or the sort of motif of uh, bricks as a way to reference the wall without it maybe being so literal. Um, are motifs that I continue to use um, mm -hmm. today. And really they're sort of stand-ins to talk about, uh, you know, the, the bodies, like the disposable bodies um, at the border, at the, at, the ex at the expense of the U.S. is militarization um, at the border. And, you know, you also start to see some of this fencing um, that was present in my earlier work from 2014, uh, my installation really safe in my room in America where I'm really, you know, thinking about the viewer being sort of separate from the space and having like that distance of, you know, similar to the video that you're an onlooker and, and you're in a, a distinct uh, separate space from the work so that you are viewing the work from the outside in. Yeah, um, you know, so much of the work, even if it doesn't have explicit references to the, or images of the body. And it seemed to be about <clears throat> all those things that we surround ourselves with or things that have personal, um, you know, connections uh, that trigger memories. And here's another couple of, of, of your paintings that, um, you know, the subject matter may at first seem whimsical, um, funny about, you know, childhood things, but the titles really drive home another level um, and start to get you to really scrutinize these things. Um, the one on the left is called um, Smile More, Riot Control. And the one on the right is called Objects Left Behind. Um, and I just want folks to adjust their eyes and really look at these for a moment because one of the things that um, I admire so much about your work is how much detail you can compress into the space and uh, how you manage that balance between um, abstraction and representation in the work, uh, especially on the right, where you are, you're, you're deliberately sort of obst obstructing a view by putting that fence in or that gate. Um, and you'll do that in a couple other kinds of works even more intensely. But as you see through, you start to sort of adjust your eye and you can make out a narrative um, based on all these objects that are, are left behind. Um, I wonder, you know, what, what made you start working that way? Was there something you saw out in the world that triggered that idea of seeing through or, um, 
did it just seem like a, a natural course of the way you were working with piping? You know, I, I think it was me um, referencing my installation work and really being drawn to, uh, you know, the way that I originally started using these gates within within my installations to, to separate audience from viewer and to, you know, reference um, architecture, the exterior of the Latinx home, a specific kind of class yeah. um, that really made me um, drawn to reuse it. But you know, through painting um, in order to also sort of play with this idea of space, um, you know, by, by having it be uh, a separation from viewer to the work. Um, so that's really what, what drew me to, to start reusing it is there's something about, um, you know, creating installations that is, that is so exciting to me that I think when I begin to sort of incorporate those references, um, that material onto painting is what excites me the most about painting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I should also mention that, you know, I was originally a painter. Um, I began as a painter and then oil painting specifically, stopped doing uh, oil painting, then went to, you know, working with, with food and found objects. And now I'm going back to painting in a way that um, is more, uh, familiar and um, exciting to me, which is working with painting in the same way that I work with installation. Mm -hmm. So the found material, the layers, the um, really trying to create like the immersive uh, sense of space. Mm -hmm. So what are those objects that are on the right, the objects left behind? Where does it come from? Yeah, so objects left behind and smile more right control are both referencing um, objects that physically get left behind on the U.S.-Mexico border. Yeah. Um, so objects such as uh, tuna cans, phones, toothbrushes, um, really personal objects that, you know, give uh, portraits of, of these individuals that, that are crossing. They're mm -hmm. intermixed with uh, objects that are personal to me from my childhood, objects that reference my own references, such as Rococo objects. Um, and then objects that are found within my community, um, you know, at your, at, uh, you know, the swap meet or at somewhere like Maxwell Street or mm -hmm. um, a secondhand store, objects that maybe are um, classified with um, being Latinx, although I would, um, I would disagree with that, but so I'm working with them in that way. Yeah. And also, you know, conflating them with um, maybe, uh, everyone's sort of understanding of, of childhood joys at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you mentioned Maxwell Street, and that's something that the two of us have in common. Um, when I was a teenager, my cousins, who are much older, who are musicians, and, um, and I'm a musician, went to Maxwell Street when it was still open air. So I got to see it before it um, was moved and put into an interior now. Um, and those were um, exciting visits, you know, and so many artists that I know uh, and have worked with in the past, um, some not with us anymore, like Ray Yoshida, um, really thought of Maxwell Street as um, a major source of inspiration and serendipity. And it's not just the stuff that was there, but the people, uh, the conversations you would have, the music you would hear on the street, all the sounds, the smells, everything about it. Um, and you did a commission uh, with another artist that resulted in some portraits of vendors, um, but also these elaborate sort of designs of um, that you see in the background here that are based on the, the material that was being sold um, in some of the by some of the vendors. So I'd love to hear how that commission came about and, and maybe what you can tell us about these two folks. Yeah. Yeah, it was really exciting to think about my work in, in this sort of uh, way to, you know, have it still serve as an installation, but then also, you know, that it would then become a backdrop for a photograph. And then, you know, the now the photograph is both, um, you know, the combined work of me and William, but um, it, you know, it began by visiting the market again. Um, it's definitely different from the time that I also visited it as a child, mm -hmm. but I was familiar with the market because it was a familiar place for my parents also, um, you know, that they visited 
on Sundays. Um, and so it, it held meaning to me in that way, um, you know, with, with other work where I often reference um, Chicago as like, you know, the first site of, of them uh, living here in the US and the sort of memories that are attached to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it started off by me doing several visits to the market and, you know, to see sort of how it had changed or, you know, who is still there and, you know, what sort of objects are being sold and um, through talking to, to various vendors and um, through then I, you know, took photographs of, of some of the objects that sparked maybe the most curiosity to me, but that also I, I saw like some uh, some of my own, uh, you know, familiarity in, in it. And then they were collaged into this uh, digital painting that then is uh, created as a repeat as a wallpaper. Mm -hmm. um, and so the only difference between the top and the bottom is the hue, um, mm -hmm. the pink or the blue. And um, both of these individuals have been vendors, I believe for over 10 years. Um, um, and so we also, another component of the work was to record their own stories of Maxwell, how long they've been vending, what mm -hmm. specifically they, they vend and their sort of relationship to the city. The project was supposed to then become um, banners for Maxwell, but, it, you know, due to COVID, I know things are sort of up in the mm -hmm. air now, but um, the plan is, is to have these images be a part of, um, you know, that street and the, and the interior also where Maxwell is now so that, um, you know, they can be visually, um, you know, seen as important uh, people who have contributed to, to the site and who have history uh, mm -hmm. with Maxwell Street. So what do you remember about these two people? I remember that I spoke mostly to uh, Rodolfo, who's at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I think Maxwell took the audio for um, the woman at the top. I, I can't remember her name or her story, but I know um, Rodolfo has been there for over 10 years. He talked a lot about how the market, uh, you know, was a place that helped him get his kids through college and, you know, how important it is that he's, he's able to work and that he, he has been able to keep his stand up for so long that he's mm -hmm. met so many people being there um and yeah he talked a lot about like the importance of of being able to vend there and how i mean you know ironically he talked about how it helped him and his family achieve like this idea of the american dream that his kids were able to attend school because of his efforts and so mm -hmm. he, you know he reminded me a lot of my dad like feeling very proud of um his children and you know also spoke about him being an immigrant and it's a, it's a very familiar story that I, I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, I hope those banners do wind up representing because these are so beautiful and so just well conceived. Um, and this idea of the, the pride that goes into making the culture and the community of, of the Maxwell Street Market, I think is represented really well in these. Um, I don't know how many other commissions you did, but one that um, fascinated me was that you got the opportunity to do a forward public facing uh, commission for windows and the Jane St. Jane Hotel in Chicago, um, a historic landmark building that um, many folks tuning in tonight might might know or have been to but um, what was that experience like for you and you know, I often I asked you before if you kind of meandered over there and listened to whether anybody was having some conversations about what they were seeing. But was this something you enjoyed doing? How much control did you have? Um, and is it something you'd like to do again? Yeah, it was really exciting. Um, you know, I think every every opportunity that I get to uh, create my work through a different medium, you know, and to to have it be um, public facing and, you know, and, um, fabricated and, you know, in a scale that I would often like to fabricate is always really exciting to me. So that was honestly my, my favorite part of, of this project was being able to, and I did have full control of, of the imagery and, and what would go on in, in this window, um, being able to digitally draw all of the components and then, 
um, you know, work with uh, my own fabricator to have them, um, you know, be created in uh, this site specific large scale um, kind of way. Mm -hmm. And it's titled Meet Me at the Green Clock because uh, I wanted to reference the way in which uh, my parents would meet after work. They both worked at Marshall Fields and Company, which is just, you know, on the other side of Michigan Avenue on State Street at another very important uh, landmark building um, with, uh, with interior designed after uh, mosaics from the Tiffany, uh, I forget his first name, but Tiffany uh, family. And um, the green clock that's on the exterior of the building on state, I think it stayed in Randolph. Mm -hmm. um, was a site where my parents would, you know, switch from their shifts. My, my dad had the overnight shift and then my mom had the morning shift. And, you know, it was, it was a place where they would meet and then, um, you know, be able to, my dad was able to, you know, go on the train and then my mom come to work and so forth. But I thought that it was really interesting that, you know, because of language barriers, et cetera, them being uh, immigrants, you know, here in the U.S. and in a whole other country, like, they saw visuals as uh, as a way of, of them meeting mm -hmm. um and so i thought there was something really poetic and important about that and i i really now have a um i have a connection to that green clock um, mm -hmm. every time that i see it and so in this work i'm drawing uh from the interior architecture of of um marshall fields while also referencing some of the art deco architecture of the St. Jane um, building itself. And so it's a combination of both while also thinking about, um, you know, these window displays um, that Andy Warhol would do in the beginning of his career, um, combined with, um, you know, some of the iconography that also makes its way into my other work that's, you know, that references the Rococo, that references childhood games such as the Polly Pocket slide. So it's sort of a um, combination of all of those um, influences within the space. And then the gates um, on the other, the other smaller window um, also makes its way into this work. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a beautiful love story, you know, just with the one phrase, um, you could, you know, just imagine um, kind of like the story around it. And um, I love the way you talk about how you have this personal connection to space and place now, partly because of that um, tale of your parents coming together yeah. that way. And, um, you know, like you said, Andy Warhol and so many other artists um, did window dressing and went, did window designs and took it very seriously. And then sort of that took that into an environmental scale for some of their work. Um, Marshall Fields also in Chicago um, at the sort of first few decades of the 20th century into maybe the 1950s and 60s had an art gallery and a lot of um, Chicago artists and national artists showed there. So uh, there's a lot of layers in that particular piece. Um, you know, we have a few more slides of some of your work just to give people a sense of the other kinds of things you do at different scales. Um, the ceramic piece on the left uh, and this other piece, which is smaller and I think is a reference to your, your bedroom at, um, after you turn 15. Um, you know, is that, that almost looks like thread, but it's probably more piping, isn't it on the right? Or is that a combination of fabric and, or, or fiber and, and paint? Yeah, it's a combination of, um, actually this is plaster plaster, fiber, and uh, found material. And then the wall is um, piped with actual frosting. And I really wanted to incorporate uh, real frosting, which I will often do within my installation so that the viewer um, believes or questions the materiality of the work as not being mm -hmm. plaster, but something edible. Yeah. And um, yeah, the piece on the left is a, a ceramic um, tableau. Um, it's one of my earlier ceramic works. I, I started making ceramics again in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, but I was looking a lot at um, sugar sculptures at this time and taking some of those references and creating my own sort of um, installations in, term, in, in a smaller scale within ceramics. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the piece on the right in particular just um, looks so much like it is edible. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah uh, we're almost at a point where we're gonna take some questions, but before that, um, you know, these are two of my favorite pieces from a series that you did. And again, we spoke earlier about um, that relationship between uh, abstraction representation and seeing through and what the barrier represents. Um, you know, both of these seem to be uh, pieces that are about control, surveillance, um, detention, um, and um, the police state. Uh, is that what they're, is that what they're, they're, they're sort of riffing on um, and connecting to the, what was going on in the news when you were working on them? Yeah, they're both um, taken from actual uh, images uh, from news media yeah. of apprehensions uh, from the border. The one on the left is from 20, an image taken from 2015. Mm -hmm. And then the one on the right is uh, image taken from 2019. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really interested, you know, like I was talking about earlier to, to have the sort of audience think about their position in, in this and what's mm -hmm. currently happening. And I think the fence serves as a way to separate a uh, viewer from uh, the content or the imagery that's in the work. But then it also, um, yeah, creates an abstraction where, you know, similar to my collages like riot control and smile more riot control and objects left behind, you're sort of um, uncovering as you're as you're viewing the work, uh, what what is behind the fence and um, starting to really make sense of the of the image that's more abstracted. Mm -hmm. um, so a few things that I just thought would be fun to look at um, before we end here and take some questions is um, sort of where you sort of fit in the continuum of, of contemporary art, but also, um, you know, what, what kinds of uh, environmental and subject matter, um, uh, what kind of scale seems to connect with you? Liza Lou's kitchen came to mind. I have no idea if you've seen this in person, um, Yvette, um, or if it's ever been a touchstone, but just seems like in your large scale installations and um, the way you talk about um, the kitchen and cooking and baking and those kinds of early um, connections and memories, uh, but then meticulously recreating that stuff in sometimes what seems to be the most difficult kind of material to handle in a, in a, in a, um, an elegant way, which you manage, um, you know, it seems to have a kind of rhyme with this. What do you think of that? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I wish I, I, I wish I had already seen this in person. I haven't yet, but I, it's, it's one of the pieces that is on my list of, you know, of works that I would love to see um, alongside other installations like the Bono Sodio, uh, who also creates these really immersive mm -hmm. installations. And, you know, even like, I know we talked about this in our first conversation, Woman House, yeah. although now it's just captured in uh, photographs, but yeah, these all of these uh, installations have been, you know, very influential in thinking about my work. And I think Robert and you froze. Robert, Jerry, I think maybe Robert is having some technical issues. Jerry? Yes, I, I, I'm not able to assist other than to unmute him. So okay. we'll wait for him to join us again. Yeah. Either way, it was a really great conversation. Maybe this is a good time for folks to just sort of marinate in what Yvette and Robert have already discussed and feel welcome to forward any questions you might have so far 
um, through the chat feature. And um, even if you're comfortable, they could just be posting these directed to everyone and then sure. um, you and Robert can um, jump on them as they come up. Yeah, yeah. sounds great. Time to submit. Oh, here he is. There you are. Oh, you're on mute. I got booted off the internet. <laughs> it's okay. It, yeah. it happens. Anyway, um, perhaps that was a, a, a sign to stop talking. Um, <laughs> I think so. That was the universe. Um, yeah, you know, the other thing that we were talking about is just how many um, other folks right now are taking inspiration from, from the Rococo and these earlier um, kinds of methods and techniques. You know, we talked about Robert Lugo, the, the, sculpt, the potter and ceramicist, um, uh, for instance, but, um, you know, maybe that's something folks could comment on when we take some questions, so. Mm -hmm. See, we have a question already um, from Joanna. Uh, Yvette, could you talk a bit about the impact of feminism and feminist art on your work? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's definitely made a huge impact. Like I mentioned earlier, um, the installations from Woman House, you know, when I first um, studied about them and art history and really, uh, you know, being drawn to the aesthetics and the movement and, um, the way in which, um, you know, they were taking over an entire house and several various uh, female identifying artists were invited to take up different parts of the house and sort of remake them through, um, you know, with their own work. Um, you know, that was really influential um, in seeing that, um, you know, other artists, um, contemporary and um, past have also influenced my work, such as the work of um, you know, feminist um, Chicana artists like Judy Baca, who was recently part of Radical Woman, a really important exhibition that happened at the uh, Hammer Museum. Um, you know, the work of Doris Salcido, which I know, um, you know, you had also shown some images of, of her work. Um, you know, contemporary artists like Ebony Patterson. Um, I always have a list of this because there's so many people yeah. that I want to mention. Um, uh, the work of, um, even the work of Mike Kelly, um, you know, the aesthetics and, you know, from a different lens, but I think that has also helped um, or been in conversation with feminist art movements, um, you know, because of Fiber, et cetera, Mike Kelly, um, you know, Carrie James Marshall, Faith Ringgold. Um, I could go on, um, but those are just some, a few. Um, you can see the video of Woman House. Okay, I need to, I, maybe I have seen it. But yeah, I, there's I uh, the Getty, I, I think in the Getty's, um, one of their archives pages, there's a link to a, a short film of students at the time from CalArts going through there. And it's, mm. it's pretty cool. It's not the entire building, I don't think, but um, the kitchen, for instance, that was so famous is in there. It's, oh, there's a 50 minute one. Okay. Oh, okay. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna look this up. Yeah. Um, let's see. In some ways, your work seems to tap into the pleasure of looking. Could you speak about that? Yeah, you know, I think I did speak a little bit about it, but I can expand more. Um, just, you know, the idea of, of the material in itself, um, you know, being so luscious, um, drawing the viewer in to want to continue to look, but then, you know, referencing that in the way in which, um, you know, the interior of the church also sort of did the same thing to me, um, being drawn to the, you know, interior aesthetics, but then not necessarily um, knowing the history or the means behind the imagery. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think that my work also works in that uh, familiar way. Um, but then through looking, um, through the pleasure of looking, then you're able to find 
um, some of the content. But you know, I like that being the, the sort of visceral invitation being the first thing that you encounter. Um, you know, and I think it's also inherent with me being so drawn to uh, materiality in my work. And I think that's um, that's the most exciting part of, of making the work is, um, is working with uh, the material, um, you know, incorporating non-traditional materials, hiding, covering, removing. Um, it's all, you know, a huge part of my uh, practice and process. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Could, do you see that, Yvette? Yeah, could you talk a little on the significance of your color palette? Yeah, um, it's actually something that, you know, has been happening in the work since 2013, but um, it's definitely since, you know, being influenced and from our conversations between me and Jillian Hernandez, um, Dr. Jillian Hernandez, who I spoke with in the last um, Zoom conversation lecture, um, you know, she talks about pink being as a weapon, pink being a weapon of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. And I was really drawn to, to that, um, that quote from her. And I'd like to think of, of my work in the same way. And, you know, I started to sort of use pink as, another material, another layer, aside from, you know, the, the piping and the collage and the, you know, the found material, pink also serves to me as another material. And, you know, I think it's, it's similar in the way in which, you know, I'm referencing women's work, um, such as baking, such as decorating, that pink also functions in that way where, you know, or the Rococo where it's often seen as being frivolous, but of course there is power in it. Um, and so I, I'm thinking, I'd like to think that I'm sort of reclaiming that and um, talking about the how powerful it is and how it can be used as a vehicle to talk about my subject matter. Yeah, I just put in the chat, I hope you've ever yes. seen Portia Munson's Pink Project, which is yes. just ferocious and hilarious and on everything. <laughs> Yeah. She should also be on my list. Yeah. Anybody else? You know, um, I just, uh, oh, let's see what we got here. Oh, Jillian Hernandez. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Yvette, how are you? How are you managing? I think everybody has this sort of question of of colleagues and friends and and people in the art world with the current state of the world. And I, I don't mean you know, I, I don't mean everything because oh my god, <laughs> yeah. But just managing being a working artist and um, wanting your stuff to be seen and probably really feeling how exciting it is to engage with an audience in person, not being able to do that. Um, how, are you, how are you thinking about your practice now while you're having time by necessity to stay in your, in your, your domestic space? You know, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, I mean, it was really hard at first, um, you know, I would say March through um, July, I was working from home mm -hmm. and um, I was actually working on a painting um, just, you know, to have something to work on at home. Like it was, a, it was two 36 by 36 canvases um, that happened to be able to fit, you know, in my apartment and the small space that I had. And so I really focused on working on those two pieces um, at the time and then, you know, it was it was really difficult to be to, to begin working on them. I think mm -hmm. because I'm so used to being in my traditional studio space, and you know, it's it's a space that I've made for me to you know be inspired and create. And um, but one thing that the pandemic definitely reminded me of, which I think is was really important to remember, is that you know I began making art in my room, in my bedroom, on my bed. 
mm-hmm. on the floor, you right. know, in any, any space that I had available. And so I think just like reminding myself of that was like inspirational in a way, yeah. like, yes, you have a studio, but I mean, you've done this before with like nail polish, whatever is around, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so then that kind of got me back into making, but it did take a good, like two months for me to do that. And then yeah. once I've returned, I mean, it's just, it's been definitely a lot slower. Um, you know, those two canvases went back to my studio and I added another two canvases and then I worked on that painting for the whole, you know, nine months um, wow. from, Mar- from March until now. And um, so I definitely think that it was sort of reflective in a way where I'm so used to, you know, pumping out work and, um, and I give myself my own, that, that pressure myself of like mm-hmm. creating type A, you mm-hmm. know, going through it but I think the slowing down was really nice in a way but of course I'm you know I'm afraid of what's what's going to happen next like when will there be an opening I've been able to sort of pop into a couple openings um, two openings that have happened here in Chicago that actually now are close to the public but um, just you know seeing how there's only like a few people I mean the times I've gone it's just been me and maybe like one or two other people and it it really takes the sort of joy away in the process of making and, you know, exhibiting and having conversations with the community about the work. And, you know, I, I miss that so much, just, you know, being in the same space as like friends and colleagues and, you know, catching up and feeling like really supported. I think now I'm starting to feel that sort of support through these kind of conversations, you know, chiming into other Zoom, lectures um but it's definitely different yeah there's been you know i've been really heartened by some of the smaller galleries in the twin cities doing installations with artists where they are deliberately being they're designed to be viewed through the windows and so um you know that seems to have been just by necessity but artists have been excited um i've talked to a few people who have shows up right now um, at different small artist run spaces yeah. that um, are really exciting by, you know, just having to work within these limitations. Um, but of course, we're all wanting to be with other people again. Um, yeah. We have more questions though. So let's see. Okay. Um, another one, there's a lot of excess, tons of color layers of one thing upon another. Do you ever feel like you're using the power of the grotesque in your work? Definitely, definitely. And I think that that makes its way maybe more in my monuments, my, um, you know, the sculptures that seem to resemble like towering cakes um, because of the sort of um, various found materials that are in the work and, you know, there's hair in some of them, real frosting. Um, So I think the combination of, of that Um, is definitely present in those works. Maybe now in Mm -hmm. um, more recent work through the access of it, I think it can definitely be grotesque. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, and maybe, you know, with your interest in the Baroque um, and the Rococo, um, I can see you, you know, doing, maybe you can do it an intervention in the Boboli Gardens in Italy someday and make a cake. (laughs) A cake cake. That would be a dream. Yeah. Yes. I would love to see that. So somebody in Italy, get on that. Please. Um, another question we have um, from our host is um, thinking about anti-monuments and what should the monuments of the future do? Who or what should they serve to recognize? Hmm. It's a tiny question. Yeah. yeah, very small. What should the monuments of the future do? I mean, I think the monuments of the future maybe there should not be any monuments or maybe we need to rethink of the way in which monuments um, make their way into society and history. Like maybe there, there should be more of a vetting uh, or, you know, a sort of communal community decision of what monuments um, go up, because I think that's really the sort of issue with, with the monuments that are present is that they're only maybe telling one side of the history and not, um, you know, both. And so I think that maybe there should be more of a vetting process in them for sure. Um, And, you know, what, who or what should they serve to recognize? 
Um, I think that they should recognize, you know, I guess influential figures who are, you know, people who are doing work with community to take these systems down. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. to reconfigure these systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, what needs to be, what is remembrance? What has to be remembered? What needs to not ever be forgotten? You know, those are the of kinds of things that as a culture, we need to continue to ask ourselves and to question. And um, the idea of these valor valorizing sculptors of great men um, uh, who, to terrible things or represented terrible things is obviously something that had to go. And yeah. you no, know, that question, the bigger conversation about what to do with all of those things. Um, I was at a talk where somebody gave an example of there's like a graveyard for these toppled monuments in Europe. I can't remember what, what, what country that was. But then um, another example that came that somebody told me about um, John Jota Leanos, who's a artist who's in California, who is gonna be in a show that I'm working on. Um, you know, he, he uses the example of going through Germany and seeing these little plaques that are to, um, you know, the atrocities that happened there so that people don't forget the individuals and the lives. Um, of having that have something to do with indigeneity um, in this country. And, you know, there's all, all sorts of our um, collective history that is so willfully, deliberately forgotten that can't be and shouldn't be. And there's very little evidence of that remembering impulse throughout this place, you know? So exactly. that's something that we should be thinking about how better to do instead of erecting another guy on a horse. <laughs> Definitely, exactly, yeah. yeah. Removing, copying, et cetera. I mean, it, it, when you spoke about Germany, it also makes me think of a friend who actually just um, was in Germany not too long ago. and. Um, she was mentioning that, you know, she was so surprised by the fact that I believe it's on top of burials, maybe, or some mm -hmm. sort of militarized, like, structure that was used in the war, um, mm -hmm. that they've actually, like, reconfigured them to house libraries on top of them. Yes. Really interesting also, and I think that's mm -hmm. a forward-thinking way of, you know, envisioning mm -hmm. monuments, too, like, Right. to maybe help them serve the communities that they're oppressing exactly. in a way. Yeah, yeah, right. Anybody else? Well, so many of us probably spend our days dealing with Zoom calls. Um, hopefully you had an enjoyable respite from that by listening to Yvette talk about her work. Thank you, Yvette, for all your work and your time. I look forward to actually seeing it in person yes. again. And um, uh, any other last parting words from folks or questions? Otherwise, I think we'll just say, have a good evening, everyone. And yeah, thank just, you so much for... Oh, oh, go ahead, Steven. I was just gonna give one quick plug yeah, no. um, for those who sure. are not following your project to check it out on uh, the Lawarsha Gallery's Instagram feed to get um, a bit of context on um, how the monument uh, piece has evolved. And then I also want to encourage folks to donate their used shoes to the project so that they could um, become piped and integrated into the piece. And that information is also available on our Instagram feed. And thank you both yeah. for being here tonight. It's been a pleasure to hear from both of you. Yeah, thank Hi, you so much. <laughs> okay. Well, have a good evening, everyone. All right. Bye.